<clears throat> wow. There are a lot of you here now. This is great. It's been a while since I've been at Forge. My goodness, it's just awesome to see the potential in this room. Just how many men have gotten up early to come and learn something of the Lord. It's a privilege to be with you this morning. Thank you, Pete, for the invitation. I think we're talking about St. Benedict's Rule. Uh, that sounds exciting, doesn't it? <laughs> um, let, me tell you, let me tell you how this got started. Uh, Pete and I have been talking for a few months. He said, hey, I'd love for you to come and um, share something about self-leadership at Forge. And I just thought, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Self-leadership. I'm like, I'm an evangelical who accidentally became an Episcopal priest. What do I know about guiding yourself rightly? <laughs> and um, so, um, so I thought I would ask my wife what she... <laughs> like, well, I'll just ask my wife what she knows about self-leadership and then just tell you what she told me, truly. And so that, that's where this comes from. We're g- <laughs> really. I'm just going to give you what my wife gave me, and we're headed towards discussing a rule of life this morning. That's really what we're talking about as we think about self-leadership. I want to just sort of um, put before you the idea of having a rule that governs your life and, and encourage you to think through that and to take that seriously. And that really did come from a conversation with my wife. Uh, we were planning a hiking trip to the Smokies. I used to live in North Carolina, and we just love to return there. And... Um, as we were planning this trip, it occurred to me like, wow, this is the third hiking trip that we've planned in the Smokies in one year. And I said to my wife, I'm like, it's, it's pretty cool that we're going on so many hiking trips. And she said, well, yeah, it's part of my rule of life. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you got a rule of life? She's like, yeah, I've decided that I'm just going to govern my life with some principles. And one of them is that we're going to go on at least three long distance backpacking trips a year. And I'm like, man, that is awesome that I'm benefiting from your discipline. I'm like, should we, can we put like a suggestion box in the kitchen where I can like, you know, slide some other things about your rule of life that will also benefit me? You can work on those. So, um, you know, it just sort of it got me thinking about a rule of life. And, and I, you know, I had a rule of life. When I went to seminary, um, I was asked to write a paper on my rule of life. And it was just about a six page lie about stuff that I don't intend to do and still haven't done. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, if you, if you know anything about pastors, uh, we tend to sort of preach the sermons that we need to hear ourselves, and, right? It's like, let's just be honest. And, um, and, and as, I, I, as I prepared for this, it just became more and more clear to me that if I'd pay attention to myself, life would be better. Um, because sometimes, you know, I feel like I'm playing Plinko with my life. Remember that game from The Price is Right? Remember that one? you got to be an old guy to know what I'm talking about. Price is right. Price is wrong, Bob. Remember that one? Yeah. Remember that game? It's like, you know, there's dollar amounts down at the bottom of this board with all these pegs on it, and somebody gets up on a ladder, and they put a little, you know, pong in, and it just got dum 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 right? And, and I think about, like, how did I end up here? What, why am I doing this? And the best reason I can come up with is, well, this happened, and then that happened, and that happened, and I feel like my whole life is just kind of reacting to a bunch of externals outside of my control. Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I mean, Pete says, uh, he's got this term for guys, you know, in my stage of life, it's a full throttle man. Is that it, full throttle? I mean, just uh, crazy would be the way I'd think about it. I mean, I'm, as, I'm just as busy as I ever want to be and hope that I ever will be. And um, sometimes I just am so uh, unintentional with what governs my day. And even for some of you men who have the grace of retirement, you've gotten to a place where you got a little money and you got a little time, you don't have to get up and do the grind every day, you can still wander for decades being far less intentional, and I want you to hear this, far less intentional with your life than your good God is. Far less intentional. You can still, even in retirement, you can find yourself caught in the tyranny of the urgent, just spending months and weeks and maybe even decades just not thinking about what you're doing and not, not being intentional about, and this is what I want to put before you all morning, this is really the word, um, what you're becoming through the tasks that you're doing. 
That's really what a rule of life is. So I, I, want, I want to introduce this term and concept to you for a moment. If you're taking notes, write this down. What is a rule of life? This is what it is. It is a collection of statements about who you're becoming that end up governing what you're doing. Now, that might sound backwards to you, but that, that really is what I feel like the, the gift is for you this morning. This is the thing that I think the Holy Spirit wants to direct your heart towards this morning and certainly direct my heart towards this morning um, to, just, to just think about a rule of life in this context. Like a, a rule for your life, a, 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 a statement that governs not what you're doing. That's secondary. But what you're becoming. Like what do I want to become today? And, and am, I be, am I becoming the right things? And are the things that are just, just attacking me from every angle and demanding my attention, are those, are those the right things? And are they causing me to become the right things? And I'll just tell you that a lot of the time, for me, the answer is no. I'm just not being as intentional with my life as I should be. So we're talking about self-leadership here. And I'm, I'm just pleading with you to be intentional with your life. Let's talk about St. Benedict. If you know anything about St. Benedict, um, St. Benedict of Nursia was a 5th century monk. So that means he lived in the 600s. I always get that backwards. 5th century monk. No, 6th century. Uh, see, I messed it up right in front of you. 6th century monk lived in the 500s. There we are, late 500s. And um, here's the deal. He, he grew up in sort of the tail end of the Roman Empire. This just... Uh, hyper, uh, permissive, busy culture of Rome, and at a very young age, 14 actually, he decided, I'm out, and I'm going to go live in a cave. <laughs> that sound nice for any like full throttle guys out there? Like, I just need like two weeks in a cave, that would be great, right? <laughs> so, so Benedict's like, I'm done, I don't want to live in the city anymore, I'm done with Roman civilization, I'm going to go live in a cave, and I'm going to do it for a purpose, here's the deal, because I want to become a person of deep prayer and intimacy with God, that's why. So, so the thing that drove him to live in a cave was this purpose for his life. Like, who am I becoming? I'm becoming a frantic, silly, just um, narcissistic, materialistic Roman. And I don't want to be that person. I want to be somebody who's deeply connected to the person of God through regular prayer. So I'm going to go live in a cave. So he did. He went to go live in a cave. But what you will know about him is that the same thing happened to him that happened to most of the monks that he's following in the footsteps of who do this kind of thing. They go out to live in a cave with the intention of being by themselves. And then people start hearing about this weird guy living in a cave and they want to come check it out. You know, there's no YouTube, so what do you do at night after work? You go hang out with the weird guy that lives outside of town. <laughs> and, and so, and so what, what began to happen is like accidentally, you know, as he comes out in the morning, there's like more and more people there, and they want to learn something deep from him. And, and so an, a community began to just sort of um, develop around this guy that really just wanted his life to be about knowing God and, and a daily rhythm of prayer. And so St. Benedict decided, you know what, we've got to have some rules that, that govern this community that's formed so that I don't lose track of the reason why I got here in the first place. Can anyone relate to that? You just spend decades just sort of letting life happen to you, and before you know it, you just have no clue how you got where you are and why you're there in, in the first place. And so, so St. Benedict developed this, what he calls a threefold, threefold rule of prayer, and it included prayer in three ways. One, uh, corporate prayers, which he called the office, the daily office, so if you're in an Anglican tradition, that will sound familiar to you. Two, private prayers that were to be said at all times during every task of the day. And then three, the full-on mass, which is a Catholic word for the Eucharist, like church service, right? So he just develops um, a threefold fold rule of prayer. And in fact, he spaces out prayer all throughout the day from morning to even. When I say morning, I mean like 1 a.m., Right? Middle of the night, he's asking his monks to get up and start their day with prayer. He had a, a series of prayer eight different times that his community was supposed to get up and intentionally center their heart around communion with the person of God. Why? Because he's living out of, hear me, who he wants to become. 
And, and, and what he's doing is serving that instead of the other way around. And oftentimes in our culture, um, listen, who we're becoming is serving what we're doing. I mean, your, your task list is doing something to you. It's forming you in a way that sometimes we don't even realize. And Benedict says, hey, let's flip that around. So I want you to ask yourself this question. Um, if, the rule of li- if a rule of life is built on the premise of answering the question, what am I becoming today? Then you should be asking yourself that question. And I want you to write it down and think about it. What am I becoming today? I mean, really think about it. And, and I don't want you to hear that as I sort of thought through this. I'm like, man, I know, I know how I would be tempted to hear this if I just walked in this morning without thinking about it. I, I would hear it in that sort of um, hyper-American obsession with making something of my future. Anybody there? Like, like, okay, I got, what am I becoming today? Oh yeah, I want to be an entrepreneurial leader. I want to be a great, I want to be wealthy. I want to have this amazing career. So I'm just going to put myself on this path to become that. And that's not what I'm talking about at all. Because I think one of the tricks of the enemy is to get you to so focus on whatever's coming next that you forget to realize that you only have one day to live. And it's today. You only have one day to parent your kids. Today. You only have one day to love your wife. Today, you only have one day to enjoy fellowship with this awesome God who loves you more than you could possibly imagine. It's today. So I think one of the things that the Lord wants us to do is just focus our heart not on some vision of the future that, listen, and oh, I need to hear this so bad, you will never attain whatever that is. You're not going to ever fully attain that. Ever. And, and, and just to center your heart on the one day you actually have and ask yourself this question, God, what am I becoming today, right now with the only day I have? What am I becoming today? And, and as I think about this, <laughs> and I, you know, speaking with my wife about the irony of giving this talk this morning, and she's laughing, she's like, yeah, you don't know nothing about any of that. Do you? <clears throat> <laughs> but I love you, happy Valentine's Day. Which, if, if that's news to you, you're in trouble. You, you need to leave right now and go buy the six roses that are still left in town. So I, I think about it, I'm like, yeah, I'm becoming angry, tired, pessimistic, lazy, fearful, right? I mean, if I'm honest, greedy. Imagine, if, you, if you're right now, like, who am I becoming today? I'm becoming a greedy narcissist. Whoa. Is that, is that what I intended to become when I launched into this career a decade ago? Is that what I intended to become when I put the ring on this lady's finger? Is that what I intended to become when I surrounded myself around these people? Or have I just kind of plinkoed with my life to a point where, like, my goodness, that's what I've earned. So, you, you know, you just back up from that and in grace. And, oh, my goodness, please, please do not hear like, oh, i got a bunch more stuff to do. In, in grace, you hear the kind words of Jesus in Matthew 11 when he says, come to me. Hey, man, come to me. You who are weary, heavy laden. You who've just gotten up underneath, and maybe you write this down, a bunch of uncommanded work. Maybe you think about that, like, where's the uncommanded work in my schedule? Where's the uncommanded work in my life? Just stuff that really, if I'm honest, is just coming out of fear. It's got nothing to do with the goodness of God calling into fellowship with Him. It's just my own frantic fear, whatever. Where's the uncommanded work? And, and And the kindness of God is that He wants to unplug you from that stuff. And, and replace it with His presence in a way that's really and truly best for you. Not more for you to do. But abundant life. Alright. <clears throat> Let me just bring you into my rule of life. I'm a simple-minded man. 
So the way, the way I've attempted to do this is to distill down a rule of life into a series of words. Just words about what I want to become today. And words put in the right order. So if you go on my Facebook profile, which you, know, you young guys don't know what Facebook is, but you know, if you're, I'm 43, so I'm, I'm tail end of Gen X, so I'm still on a Facebook. All right. Um, then you're going to see these words right under, underneath my, my Facebook profile. And this is my rule of life, and it's just this that I want to become in this order, Christ follower, husband, today, not, not some future version of myself, today I will be Christ follower, first, and then I will be husband, second, and then I will be father, third, and then I will be pastor, fourth, and then cyclist and fisherman. <laughs> I, mean, I can ride my bike, man. Love riding my bike. Ride my bike 200 miles a week. I fish most Fridays. But those things serve the other four. Those things find their place after I've found my heart in God. Husband. Comes after. Christ follower. Parent. Comes after. Husband. Pastor. Good grief. Has got to serve those things. Because, you know, I've been a full time professional Christian for five years, and my kids still love me. They do. And they even love my church. And my church is pretty awesome, but it's not that awesome. It's not. I mean, let me just be honest. Like, lest you're thinking about coming, I just want to just tell you right now. It's not that awesome. It's just stay where you are. It's better, I promise. You're welcome, Jason. Yeah. All right, a few more minutes. Listen, listen to this. Uh, <clears throat> James K.A. Smith, I like this guy, Christian philosopher. Okay, he wrote a great book. So if you're into this, this is sort of triggering something in you, maybe you read this book. It's entitled, You Are What You Love. Okay, and he talks about the tremendous power of habit. And, and here's what he says in his book. His premise is that you're primarily not a thinker, you're a lover. It's an appropriate thing to say on Valentine's Day. And, and so your task list in your life is, is aligned not with what you think, but with what you love. So, so then your schedule, here, and here's what he says in the book, your schedule, the things that are on your, on your do, to-do list today, they, they both inform what you love and form what you love. They, they, they simultaneously tell you what you love and also inspire what you love. Direct it, cultivate it, nurture it in such a way that you become those things. So I want you to ask yourself this question, maybe. This would be a good discussion question. What, what does my schedule say about what I love? God, that's a messed up one, isn't it? I mean... You know, you, you get up first thing in the morning and you start your day with cable news and, and you get all ticked off about some circumstance that's entirely out of your control and then go through your whole day talking to everybody at work about it and then you come home and end your day with three more hours of it? Right? I mean, what does that say about you, what you love? Well, I go, I don't love that guy. That's weird. He's a politician or whatever. Maybe you do. What does my schedule say about my love? And, and think about this. Maybe ask this question. What are my habits teaching me to love? Oh, this is an even more awful one to ask at 730. What, what are my habits teaching my kids to love? What are they teaching my grandkids to love? What is my wife learning to love as she watch, watches me live in this way? <clears throat> and if you just dive into this book from James K. Smith, it gets even more frightful as he starts, talk, starts talking about psychological research. He quotes a guy from uh, the University of Virginia psychologist named Timothy Wilson. And here's what Timothy Wilson says. He, and this guy should know what he's talking about. He says that perhaps only about 5% of 
of what we actually do in a given day is the outcome of conscious, deliberate choice. You're like, what? <laughs> right? Well, what if only 5% of what you actually do in a given day is, is the outcome of a deliberate choice that you make right then, and the other 95% is just the result of a habit that you form for yourself that you're just in like a rut? Anybody go four-wheeling? You know, you get in that rut, you're like, you can't get out of it. What if that's like actually 95% of your day is just formed for you as you've created habits over your life that you now, without even realizing, are just fully living into? What if they're the wrong habits? That's terrifying. I mean, anyone ever been, you know, driving? You go on a, you drive to, you know, drive to the beach or something, you drive down to Miami, and you, you get there four hours later, and you cannot remember one second of actually hitting the gas pedal or turning the steering wheel? That's scary for a cyclist. <laughs> Hate you guys. I, I lived in a little town in North Carolina, and after about you know, five years, the Holy Spirit started to say to me, you know, Tom, do you think it's necessarily a good thing that the guy that runs the Bible school in town has shown the entire town his middle finger? I'm like, <clears throat> no, that's probably not a good thing, God. Why don't you just wave instead of... <laughs> God bless you! God bless you, postal lady! The, the post office lady, um, she, she would pass me like this close. I'm like, dude, just give me my three feet. What am I talking about? No idea. Oh, yeah, okay. What I was trying to say is um, it's not just driving that you do that with. It's your whole life. It's your whole life that you do that with. And that's just the way our brains are wired to just live into the habits that we form. And I want you to be intentional about them. And, and I want you to hear this as a lifting of burdens, not a putting on of a burden. So um, let me just read for you the words of Jesus, Matthew 11. <clears throat> just real quick, Matthew 11. Man, such awesome words. Verse 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary, we just wear ourselves out on things that don't profit. Come to me, all you who are weary, carrying heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Um, what, what this will be for you as you invite the Lord to sort of um, let you draw him to myself, it, to himself, it will not be a taking on of things. It'll, for most Americans, it's usually a, a, a putting off of things. It's not an addition to your schedule. For most of you, coming to Jesus, um, just getting intentional about drawing near to Him is going to be a putting off of things. It's going to be a release of things that don't profit. Come to me, all you who are weary, carrying heavy burdens, I'll give you rest. <clears throat> Take my yoke upon you. Um, you should hear these words in context to what the Pharisees were saying, which is, if you want to live an abundant and thriving life, this is what the, the Jewish teachers were saying in the first century, you need to take upon your life the yoke of the law. Like, yoke yourself to the law, just as you yoke yourself to another ox to pull a plow. And Jesus is like, uh-uh, no. You want to understand abundant life, then you yoke yourself to me. And for you, it will not be a putting on of things. It's going to be a taking off of things. And, and the context of this passage tells us that so clearly. You read the next chapter, chapter 12. Jesus starts describing what the Sabbath means to someone who's not bound up in this legalistic awfulness of the Pharisees who've made so many rules about the Sabbath that you can't even pick a wheat. You can't even take a piece of grain from your own field and put it in your mouth lest you break the Sabbath. My goodness. That's the context of this text. And Jesus is like, you don't have a clue that when you'll just draw your heart to me, it's not just going to become this burdensome task list. It's usually a removal of tasks that shouldn't be there in the first place. Wow, I just got an amen. I'm not used to that. <clears throat> Episcopalian, we don't do that stuff. <clears throat> All right, this is the last thing I want to say. So, for Jesus says, For I'm gentle and humble in heart, 
and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy. I just want to focus on that word easy for a minute. Maybe this will mean something to you. I don't think that's the best translation. It's hard to take a Greek word and turn it into, e- in, into English. Um, it, the word does mean easy, um, but, it, but it also means kind. Okay? Jesus is saying, you, you just sort of yoke yourself to me. What you're going to find is not an easy life. Like, as someone who puts an, a yoke on an ox, like, you're, you're still going to ask him to pull a heavy load. Okay? It's, not that, it's not that your life will be easy, but what you'll find in me is kindness. Like, I want to be kind to you, says a holy Jesus. And, and I just want to ask you, and I'm asking myself here, have you allowed the Holy Spirit to to be kind to your day planner. And or when you think about God, maybe this is what you came to hear this morning. For those of you who are online, maybe this is what you're supposed to be hearing. When you think about God, is he as kind to you as you are to your dog? Right? I mean, we think about kindness like, I, I, I mean, well, that Jesus is saying, you come to me, you're going to be greeted with kindness. Like, okay, I just think about my dog when I'm thinking through this. I'm like, I, I, who doesn't want to be kind to their dog? Is that, is that the kind of God you have? When you draw near to him, he's going he's gonna to greet you with, hey, I know, man, you have, I know where you're at, and I just want to cover you with the kindness of my presence. There's a season. I'm going to turn you all into Anglicans in the next 30 seconds. Okay, and here's how I'm going to do it. There's a season of the church here that's supposed to set you up to think about these things, and we're about to start it in two weeks, and it's the season of Lent. Lent. And, and here's, the whole, here's the whole sort of purpose of the season of Lent, that you would, on an annual basis, think about your life the way God tells the story of the Old Testament through the Israelites, that you come out of the house of slavery in Egypt, right, and you come through the waters of newness of life for a purpose of finding God in the wilderness, 40 years, so you come out of Egypt, you go through the waters of new life, you get saved, and God wants to reorder your life in every way around nothing but His presence. He wants to sterilize your life and remove every part of the oldness of Egypt. You hearing that? It's a, Lent, it's a removal of things so that you would replace it with the fiery presence of Almighty God. You and Him. And so I just want to encourage you. I mean, you've got two weeks to think about it. You know, we, we hear people say, oh, I've given up you know, something for Lent. Why? Why would you do that? Here's why. And, you know, you hear people say, I, g- I gave up meat for Lent. And I think, why? What's meat doing to your spiritual life? Really? H- here's what I want you to think about. Like, what, what parts of this Egypt life that, that have just continually done this to my heart does God want to just wrench me away from for this season where I would replace it with His fiery presence? And for me, it would be a kindness. It would just be a kindness in every way. All right? That's Lent, and, and I want you to think about it. So, uh, I've gone too long. Think about it around your tables. I'm, I'm quoting you, and I'll get you out of here on time, all right? guys was that an awesome talk this morning huh I'm going to bring Tom up here in a second but uh, I want to wrap up by just saying Tom really gave us a lot of things that just tap into what we do uh, and gave me new language for the things that we say around here to forge and, and it was awesome so let me wrap up give you the forge essentials Guys, we always say around here, invite a friend, invite an enemy, right? Doesn't matter. There's a lot of men that, uh, that need what we do. We have the best coffee in town now, right? Anyway, right? Huh? Huh? Chris Culver, our godfather coffee uh, of coffee is here. And so uh, invite a friend, invite a... Listen, become a partner. Uh, what we're doing around town is so important. And if you are not a partner, would like to have every... 
Every man, some skin in the game, go to FordStreet.com and you can become a part of what we're doing there. Apply what we learn, right? We're not just here to do a study. Um, we're here not just to hear stuff. We're here to take it and apply it. So pass it on uh, with somebody that you know. I am. Uh, Tom's going to be speaking Thursday live to our Forge group in Longwood. So if you want to bring a friend Thursday to hear him live, uh, that, that's, that's a great thing. But also, we're going <clears> to <throat> have this online by noon today. And you can pass this, this on to a friend uh, or an enemy. Um, Daddy, daughter, dance, first Saturday night in March. Coming up, Dave Cutlinios, the cutter. Dave, the cut man. Dave's going to be back, back there. Do not pass him by without saying, I will help you set up or take down. It's going to be a great time. It's sold out already, sorry. But it's going to be a great time. It's one of the things we do as Forge is an outreach to our community. Uh, Creston Lifefried and his wife get the credit for this. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, pray for Forge. God has given us opportunities that are surprising us. Satellites, that uh, guys want to start satellites. Our, our commitment is to the greater Orlando area. You know, we're, we're, we didn't set out, nor we intend to try to do a, a, a national, international ministry. That's not our goal. But our podcast is being heard in 23 countries. That's cool. We got one German. Putin listens to us, I told you. Uh, you know. So there's a... <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of cool stuff that's happening, but our major focus is here in the greater Orlando area. When we started Forge, we wanted Forge to become a, a, an influence that would make Orlando a man city. So, so that wherever a man went in the city, he'd find another man who had the boldness to at least introduce him to Jesus. And that's our vision. He's given us more opportunities uh, we need more wisdom, more prayer. Uh, I need you to pray because you are such a core. And um, Tom, come up here for a second. You know, Tom talked about a rule of life. I, I tell you, I, uh, a lot of your language today, and I didn't give you a mic because you might start preaching again, um, but, um, <laughs> um, but um, I, I learned from him a great deal, and I want to give you our challenge coin uh, which is not a piece of merch, but our, all of our team leaders have our challenge coin. It's a new thing for us as Forge. Uh, our team leaders have them and can give them, but it, it's an honor and a challenge cone in the military uh, model. And we want to honor, honor you for what you are doing in ministry and have done to build men and then continue to give you that challenge to build great men as God defines greatness. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You'll be seeing our challenge coin more. Terry Turner designed it. Uh, you go to lunch with a guy that has one, throw it on the table. If he doesn't have his and he's supposed to, he has to pay. <laughs> Keep that in mind, brother. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, how we thank you for your goodness to us. How we thank you for the gospel, Jesus that you have not called us to be your sons to make our life worse but better. How you do give us a burden that is kind. We praise you, our living Savior, and we give ourselves to you. Bless Tom, his wife, his kids, his ministry. Bless the word today, we pray. Bind the hand of the evil one that would keep him from Tom so that Tom and the rest of us could be unleashed to glorify your great name. Give us a great day, we pray in your strong name, Jesus. God's men said, Amen. Amen.